Three, two, one, live. Anthony Darby. Chuck Ken. Episode two of the Peninsula Podcast. Uh, start off, I just want to thank everyone so much for the amazing support of episode one. Um, everyone that took the time out of their day and um, the 247 people that, that viewed that video. I think it was 251, actually. So, whoa. Yeah. I, the four, I guess subtracted uh, your mom, your dad, <laughs> <laughs> the four people, friends and family. Um, honestly, I'm really, um, really humbled and, and really excited that people are taking the time. We've personally got a lot of good feedback. A lot of our friends, family, uh, folks in the industry have taken some time and, and they said they learned something, which I think that's really one of the biggest goals here is this is supposed to be for education. This is supposed to provide you kind of the behind the scenes stuff that we can't get anywhere else except for living the day to day that we're doing. Right, Chuck? Yeah, that's right. And uh, I just want to second the support that we got. I think it's been awesome. Like Darby said, we got tremendous feedback. And our goal, like Darby said, is to educate. And I think the topic today um, is going to be really, really educational. And so questions we get all the time, um, the differences between hemp and can marijuana, as we'll discuss in a second, um, and how it plays into the overall role of the total cannabinoids and the local economy. There's just a million questions about it. And it's at the forefront now because of the farm bill. So we'll get into all those subjects today. So today is, is all about hemp. Um, I'm going to break down the parts of the plant. What is hemp? I'm going to get into um, different cultivation methods, different processing methods. And then it's really, uh, I'm going to get into the farm bill. And then it's all going to really lead and crescendo up into the biggest topic of the day is CBD. Um, we're going to get into CBD and other cannabinoids that can be derived from hemp. And I'm going to take a hard take on several different ways of, of running a, a CBD business ethically. Um and I think that it's a topic that a lot of folks are desperately seeking information on. So I'm hoping that this is a kind of a, one of the sources that will help um, clarify some things for everyone and also kind of spark um, some interest that you will go out and do your own research because there's just a lot around hemp and hemp is a medicine uh, that I think a lot of people can benefit from. So as Chuck kind of early alluded to, um, for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to do something that I absolutely hate doing, and that's I'm going to refer to cannabis as marijuana. And I'm going to re refer to cannabis as marijuana because technically hemp and and marijuana are the exact exact same plant. The only differentiation is a artificial differentiation that our federal government has put on that says if it's less than 0.3%, 0.30% THC, it is identified as a hemp plant, and if it is above 0.3%, then it's considered marijuana or cannabis plant that we're familiar with at our dispensary. Um, that's it, It's important because when you look at a field, um, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was hemp. You wouldn't know if it was actually smokable uh, cannabis that would get you uh, intoxicated. Um so it's, it's just important that we start making a differentiation. I think a lot of times there's just some sort of a notion that these are two completely separate plants and are two completely separate things. And the truth is, is if you're farming hemp in, uh, for industrial purposes and you're growing hemp for CBD and you use too many nu nutrients and the Department of Ag comes out and they do a soil test or not a soil test, but they do a test on that plant and that plant tests higher than 0.3% THC, you're no longer a hemp farmer. You you're are a marijuana farmer. Yeah, and chances are, if you got a couple acres, you're now a, a, a big one. Yeah, <laughs> congratulations. And also a felony. By the <laughs> and way. Also a felony. So that's really not the goal. So um, for just for sake, because the technical scientific name for hemp is cannabis sativa, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm discussing my great sativas that I love so much in, in our dispensary. So I'm just going to call it marijuana. I'm going to call the call the cannabis marijuana, um, and separate it from hemp just for the sake of the discussion. So. Uh, first things first, let's kind of talk about the different parts of the plant. I think that a lot of folks, including myself, when I understood that hemp has got a lot of different uses, I hear about it being used as biofuel, I hear about it, people eating the seeds, I understand that CBD comes from it. Um, it took me a little while to really comprehend how many different strains and different types of these hemp plants that there are, and then the different uses based upon the type of the plant. So... The seeds in the plant, uh, they're mainly used in dietary products. Um, they can be pressed and made into an oil. You can feed these to livestock. You could also, um, humans will eat these. They're very high in protein. Um, we also see the seeds being applied in cosmetic um, products and beauty products as well. 
Then you have the bast, which is the fiber. Uh, the biggest differentiation I want folks to understand about the fiber is I'm not talking about the stalk itself. I'm talking about the first layer of fiber that's actually going to wrap around the woody core stalk. So when you're talking about the application of the uses of, of, of hemp fiber, like canvas and textiles, um, they understand it's a very small part of the plant. It's that wrapping of the plant, and it's not the actual stalk or the woody core. That woody core is called the shiv, um, and that's the that's the part, uh, the woody core part of the stalk is what they're typically going to be grinding up. Um, they make a lot of um, pulpy mixtures out of it, and then they can turn it into everything from hempcrete, which is like a hemp concrete, um, any of their paper products, um, animal bedding, replacements for plastics. So a lot of the woody core is typically being broken down into like a pulpy material and then made into end products because of its strength. Um, depending on who you talk to and, and what research you do, you'll see that, that there's um, a ton of strength in, in reformulating the woody core and bringing it back together. You can make some really strong things and a lot of people feel that building materials and things like that can be made from it. Yeah, and I think, um, I'm not sure if it's made from that part of the plant or not, but I know in Europe, a lot of the automobiles, a lot of the um, plastics inside the interior of the automobiles are being replaced and manufactured with hemp parts and byproducts. So that's just one um, sign that this thing has industrial uses. I saw another domestic company in the U.S. is basically putting out a material that they're advertising as a replacement for oak. Um, the capital... Uh, company that one of the big finances of this company was a Maryland based company which I found interesting but it was like an article that was shared all over LinkedIn replaces oak like as an oak floor as an oak wood yeah the nice. flooring and just almost like of, bamboo I guess it would be the same type of idea the yeah. fiber and stuff seems about the same tensile strength and I think um, Chuck you bring up a great point in the fact that I think when folks look at hemp and bamboo they see the similar tendencies of this quick growing like it, it it doesn't take a lot of for anybody that's ever had bamboo in their yard. You know, I have some now. It's impossible. <laughs> it's miserable. I'm about remediate. to dig a three foot trench and fill it with concrete. I think it's the next step. <laughs> I don't know if that's environmentally safe, but <laughs> probably anyway. not. Um, the, the, it's got a lot of usefulness in the fact that it's a very strong and, and um, it doesn't take a lot to grow and it comes back year after year. So um, I think you're, you're right that the stalk, uh, the woody core probably is a lot of similar that we see within um, the bamboo tree as well. And then lastly is the flower and buds on the plant. Um, typically, when we look at marijuana, that's where all the goodies are. So that's where all your cannabinoids, your terpenes, your flavonoids, that's where all the action-packed medicine from the plant is going to be within those buds and flowers. Um, same similarity with hemp, but typically with industrial hemp, especially depending on what type of application you use, a lot of the times the the plants are not even being harvested or actually cultivated long enough to even get to that flowering stage. Um, only really CBD is the only time that you'll really see them really pushing towards that late flowering stage. Um, any thoughts on the, the, the parts? No, I think uh, the biggest differentiator is there. You know, there's one plant, but multiple parts, and each one of those parts serves its own purpose, whether it be for medicine in the form of CBD, or their cannabinoids, or a plastic seed, animal feed. It's a really, really versatile plant. I really thought that um, basically the stalk was harvested like as one piece. Yeah. I didn't realize that you they blew were my mind when you brought that to the, my the, attention the last week. Off. Yeah. That was like kind of my aha moment from that takeaway. Um, also, it, it, when you when you there's so much in our, our language and our words that sometimes we don't always think about it. But like when I've heard the word canvas for forever, I never tied it back to the fact that canvas was originally derived from hemp, which is cannabis sativa, which is why it's called canvas. Like we don't always put these things together and we think of hemp as kind of this new age product. And then Christopher Columbus made his, his sales out of it. Right. So we'll, this kind of was a nice segue into the history of hemp. So, I mean, we look at hemp, there's, it traces all the way back to six to 8,000 BC. It was a, in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. We can trace it back to Europe, 1200 to 1200 BC. Um, and then from that time period, all the way up through the middle ages, it's an incredibly vital crop. I mean, there, like I mentioned, all of your, your shipping industry uh, in the early times, it's all based around hemp derived textiles and fabrics they're eating hemp seeds they're using hemp um in as a medicinal tool and basically as a as a food source um 
and then at an international level, just to bring it to today, you're seeing that, that currently there's 32, 32 countries in the world right now that cultivate hemp. Um, so it's just something that's fairly widespread, and the U.S. is, is significantly behind. Your, your takeaway from this piece is, is if they've been doing this in China and in India for 6,000 years and a bunch of farmers are going to start in Idaho next week, you know, how, could, how are they going to compete? How are the lessons learned and the maturation of those foreign markets somehow going to subside to the fact that some new guys in the, in the United States are going to start growing? I think it's really important to understand that there is this huge, huge market for hemp. Um, but as Chuck and I are going to dive into, I think there's a, a special piece of that market that's for U.S. and domestic production, not so much all of the industrial side of it. Um, so kind of we've heard about the international side of things. So now bringing it into the U.S., um, we see pre-colonial times the hemp is around. We see that in Jamestown, it's actually written and it's mandated the colonies. If you are early a colonial settler, um, it is required that at your settlement, you are growing hemp because of the viability of the seeds for food. They needed the textiles because they had to recreate everything. There's, this is, there's nothing here. You're building a civilization from, from scratch. And out of all the tools uh, at your hand, you know, these guys recognize early that hemp is one of their best tools that they can use. It's, it's amazing. You see tons of studies done by the U.S. government from the colonial times up into the early 1900s. Uh, efficacy of, of hemp farming, hemp production, um, uh, food source, even some CBD medicine uh, and, and hemp being used as a, as a medicine source uh, at this time as well. Um, but all of that is going to fall to the wayside come 1937 when you start seeing this, this shift in nature where cannabis and marijuana. So at, at this point before 1937, hemp and marijuana are, are almost similarized as one and the same with the differentiation of THC content. And you have big pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly. Um, Merck, and they're making tinctures with marijuana. It's at, it's, it's at every drugstore. Marijuana and hemp are not seen in any way as a harmful substance, as something to be feared. It's just that's not the nature of the game until we see reefer madness take place, until we see the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937 take place. And then all of a sudden, both marijuana and hemp really get put on center stage of the political kind of train and you see a really a, a, a fabricated attack against both hemp as e everything from a textile and these are led by interest from folks like DuPont who have nylon at the time um, competing against hemp and canvas and all the textiles uh, all the way from big pharma coming in competing against the marijuana uh, medicines of the world so uh, Henry Anslinger is a, a bastard in my mind, and that guy, when he got done trying to prohibit booze, needed something to do with all of his enforcements, and whoever the poor SOB, marijuana and hemp lobbyist was at the time, was not very effective, and he let this guy railroad him in Congress, and you see literally at the shape of an act of Congress and, and a strong lobbying effort, a medicine and an incredibly vibrant textile and multi-consumer good entire industry industry just get crushed and um and and hemp still kind of trickled around a little bit in that time period between 37 and 70 it wasn't technically until the federal government um passed the controlled substance act of 1970 that officially officially made hemp cultivation and processing illegal um because even during that time of, of 37 and 70, you have this huge attack on hemp. And then, like everything else, you know, a national interest comes up. We have World War II going on. They recognize that hemp could be a viable tool if we cultivated it, processed it quickly to get it out to our troops. Everything from uniforms to a variety of other net necessities. Mm. They show a bunch of Midwest farmers uh, a, a video called Victory for Hemp. These, these farmers, they go and they, they serve their country. They grow a million acres of hemp. They set up these processing entities all around the Midwest to process all this hemp, get it out to the, the military, and then as soon as the war is over, they come in, they shut down the processing facilities. The farmers go back to growing potatoes and soybean, and uh, you know it's kind of business as normal. So it's, it's, 
It's interesting and very inconsistent when you look at how hemp and marijuana have been treated throughout our history and really the the amount of dollars and cents that have been spent to regulate such something that in a lot of ways seems like it's so useful to so many people. Um, and then we come to kind of today where we've seen a lot of, of recent uh, hubbub and, and noise around hemp. Um, in 2014, our first opportunity to start doing some research and pilot programs come with a, uh, a passage of a, an amendment to the Farm Bill of 2014. Can, uh, states like Kentucky... West Virginia take really early leads. Um, you see guys like Mitch McConnell getting behind the hemp movement and really starting to push things along. And uh, Maryland also took a you know a very proactive role in um, in joining on and getting an industrial hemp program in place right before what happened in December. Most recently, and this is what I think most people are familiar with, is the fact that the farm bill passed. You want to go into a little bit about the farm bill? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, where do we start? The farm bill is one of those bills that comes up for, I guess, what do you call it? Reallocation vote, whatever the terminology is. Every one, two, I forget how it is, but it's one of the bills that comes up frequently. And if they allocate time, a dollar, it's only for four years and you got to yeah, ask for that dollar yep. back again in and, a couple of years. And what a lot of people don't understand about the farm bill itself is the fact that it is um, a lot of the... A lot of the agricultural commodities and subsidies come out of there, so it's something that the farmers look forward to, and it changes how they have to do business every year. Um, it's stamps food well. stamps programs. It is a tremendous amount of the discretionary kind of spending of the federal government goes in the farm bill. It's much bigger than just the farm bill. Um, and of course, as far as we're concerned, what we're talking about today on the topic of hemp, the farm bill really opened up hemp to allow it to kind of get its roots and start to flourish in the United States. And what it essentially did was remove it right from um, the what's the um, scheduling, the right? It, it removed oh. it from the control, controlled substances list and, and basically DEA said purview and to the Department of Ag's purview. To the Department of Ag's purview. Yep. So now the Department of Agriculture, the Federal Department of Agriculture kind of oversees this hemp program and they don't want a whole lot to do with it, so they're kind of leaving it up to individual states. So basically what the Farm Bill says is that it is legal to grow, process, and distribute um, industrial hemp in the United States as long as you do it under the Farm Bill, which also has to be under a state's kind of own program. Um, so in order to do it in a specific state, that state's Department of Agriculture has to have a hemp program that is in line with the federal government's. Think casino, think alcohol. So federal government comes out and says alcohol is legal as a substance, but every single state, every county, every city has the right to regulate it themselves. Yeah. And every and the federal government is going to require that it's regulated <laughs> by a state, by state entity. So hemp's the same way. So um, now the farm bill is passed. You can't just go out in your backyard and start growing half acres of hemp and trying to slang it on the, on the market. That's not really how it works. Um, every single state is going to set up their own regulations. So Maryland's uh, went through a two-step process. I mentioned that they were early adopters of the research pilot program, which really started, and that's what we're going to see this year. So if you know anyone that's actually growing this year in Maryland, they're not growing under the new Farm Bill platform. They're still growing under the guidelines of a research pilot program with a university partnership. Um, House Bill 698. Yes, House Bill 698, the Maryland Industrial Hemp Research Pilot Program. Now, just last week, maybe two weeks ago, two weeks ago, two now. weeks ago, we saw the passing of House Bill 1123, and that is actually in line with the actual farm bill that came in December. That will take place next year. That will remove the requirement for the University of Partnership. It will give Maryland's Department of Agricultural the purview and scope to police and regulate um, that program. And um, it, it also established a fund. Yeah, right? so the fund, so actually the fund that it established, um, so those of you, which many people probably don't know, I, I think initially when this came out, it's such a big thing for the, it's a really big undertaking for the Department of Agriculture. 
Um, and they didn't have the funds. They didn't have the appropriations in the state to administer such a fund. So House, or so the first bill that passed, the Senate Bill 698, um, the Department of Agriculture kind of took a hands-off approach. You had to apply through them, but you had to have a partnership with the university. Um, and in, so what the fund does is the fund allows the department to kind of regulate um, to regulate the hemp industry and like Darby said, takes out the requirement that you deal with the university. So what the fund does, and it actually, I believe, gives appropriations from the state of Maryland to fund it, uh, to hire the staff necessary to do the testing, to do all the requirements that are kind of in the farm bill. So now the farm bill is passed and every state is, is likely within the next several years to enact the hemp bill. I think it's important to understand like the different ways of, of cultivation, different processing entities, because like I mentioned before, and we broke down the parts of the plant, um, depending on what type of the part of the plant you're trying to bring to market, you're going to have a completely different cultivation process, different completely processing. If you're growing for seed, you're not going to do the same thing as CBD. If you're growing for CBD, you're not going to do the same thing as fiber or, or textile. So I'm going to try to go through quickly um, the differenti differentiations of methods, kind of what you're looking for, and just kind of set at a high level what the, the different metho methodologies look like. So uh, for cultivation for seed, it's a mechanical process. Um, there's no need to sex the plant. So males and females can all go together. You're looking at literally just throwing seeds in the ground in a very industrial style way. Um, it's going to be and letting, letting them uh, cross produce and then they'll just simply begin to start generating seeds. The cannabinoid content of CBD or THC in those seeds will be none um, and, uh, at all. And even if you were to take those seeds and then plant them, you'd find that they're going to have very small contents of anything in there um, based upon the nature of, of what it actually is, the, the, the biology of those seeds. Because you're really trying to harvest that stuff before it even starts to Yeah, these are the seeds that, so flowers. if you've ever walked by Whole Foods and saw a bag of hemp seeds for protein and said, oh, could I go and throw it in my backyard and grow hemp? No, you cannot. <laughs> um, that's not how it works. Uh, when you harvest this, uh, these grains or these small seeds, you're going to use the same exact equipment that you would for other grains. So it's a, it's a, it's a mechanical process. Um, it's not overly complex at all. It's not the easiest form of, of cultivating hemp, but it is fairly, um, fairly uh, low cost and low technology. The biggest issues and challenges that they face right now is they're seeing a, a decrease in, in price. Um, it, this is not a highly profitable form of cultivation for hemp. Um, and there's a lack of processing resources for these farmers. So these farmers, if they, they would be able to demand much higher prices for their product if they had better end users. And that's a big gap that we see not just in Maryland, but nationally because this is all new and there haven't been, there hasn't been a large quantity of inputs to the processors to really justify a strong business model. You don't see a lot of processors out there. And now there's this kind of chicken egg concept where either processors are going to have to pony up the money for the infrastructure and resources to get in place and get ahead of the farmers but these farmers are constantly going to be struggling to find end buyers for their product because the processors aren't going to have the capacity to continue to process the amount of, of increase in supply that these guys are going to start coming up with. Um, this is cultivation for seed, but this is completely different than what I just talked about. So the last part of cultivation for seed that I want to mention is a very niche part of seed cultivation. And that's these folks that are cultivating for the genetic side of things. This is a very scientific and a, a very important piece of um, the CBD side of cultivation hemp is the genetics, probably more so than on the fiber textile and the other sides of things. We are seeing some uh, companies that are that are basing a multi million dollar business model just based around based around having the best genetics of hemp seed for CBD production. Um, we see that in the, in the marijuana slash cannabis industry now. Uh, genetics are huge. Our patients are, are demanding to see the genetics of, of the strains. Um, these folks that have the strongest genetics, that have land race strains, that, that have um, super, super high THC content or, or CBD content, like um, 
even like the guys at G Leaf, they have a strain called Painkiller. It's one of the highest CBD content strains in, in the country. And it's a very sought after strain. When we get that in our uh, dispensary, even though it's not high in THC, it's high in CBD, people eat that up. So um, there is a, there is this, this growing industry just around the genetics of CBD seed and cloning. Um, and I think the clone side of things will continue to, to grow as well when folks get the certainty of getting past seed process. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> that that part, and we're going to dig really deep into the CBD uh, portion in a little bit, but I think what people are going to start to see is kind of that the CBD side of the hemp game is going to start to look identical to what it looks like in the marijuana side, um, where you're starting to clone your them inside for greenhouses for the highest cannabinoid content that you could possibly get with the best genetics that there is. I mean, it's just that's the way the industry is going to go. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, for two reasons. One is because it's the same plant, right? And it's yeah. the same industry. And the other is because if it's not the same industry, you're seeing a lot of the cannabis guys getting into the hemp industry and making it the same industry. So you're going to see a lot of the best practices and a lot of the things that are working for those guys in cannabis being quickly transferred over to hemp. Um, and it's like Chuck said, we'll dive into the CBD. Uh, I don't want to hijack fibers spotlight. And, uh, it's everybody's favorite subject, right? <laughs> I know that uh, the CBD is everyone's favorite subject. But this stuff's important, too. And I think it's, it's interesting as well to understand, you know, what our farmers are looking at yeah. in terms of, on you know, we're based out of the Eastern Shore, Maryland. We're in an ag community. We talk a lot of farmers. We know that there's a couple of things happening right now. Is one is they're getting less than they used to get for typical crops like corn, corn and soybean. We know there's a huge shortage of young farmers these days because they're not super excited about the business outlook and it's farming's not easy work. And I think that hemp is something that's attractive to younger folks, can provide some better um, business modeling and business outputs. And I think that this is something that would be a really good boon for the Eastern Shore in a time when everything is consistently uh, getting looked at from our foot environmental footprint of chicken farming and, and, and other animal That's farming. A good point. You know, we're looking at remediation options. The one thing about hemp is that it's one of the best tools for remediation that you can find. I mean, if you had a, a nuclear bomb disaster, the best thing that you could do is, is or a nuclear waste incident, the best thing you could do is plant a ton, a ton of hemp around it because it's going to suck up everything that's in that soil and, and put it in there. That's also when we get into CBD, why well, you have so many issues with quality and, and outputs and things like that. So when you are cultivating for fiber, um, which is still a, a viable soy source, this is probably the easiest form of hemp farming. Um, you are planting the seed and then you are letting the hemp plant grow tall and skinny, and then you're cutting it down before it starts flowering or seeding. So you're only growing this, uh, this plant for typically like four weeks, um, maybe eight weeks. Typically, I think um, it probably depends on the climate that it's in and a multitude of other kind of different things. But it really, the but idea is it's, point, about, really it's, about half, it's about half yeah. the cycle of if you were trying to grow for a flowering or a seeding plant uh, because you're getting it out of there. Uh, it's interesting, though, like one of the biggest challenges with when you're cutting down hemp for a fiber is it's so great because it's this industrious, like super tough and steel like material but when you're trying to cut it down it just destroys farm equipment it's because it's so tough it's so you know you're not going to be able to use typical hay or uh equipment you know typical equipment that you would go out there and do with a much softer or less uh fibrous product so they say that like you know sickle bar mower is one of the best ways to to chop that stuff down and we find that they're getting one and two and a half tons per acre um, the, the guys in the max are getting five tons per acre and they're getting somewhere between seven, 11 cents per pound. Um, so this is not again, an overly profitable ver venture. When you look at what these folks are getting for the CBD flowering side of things. And then you'd also have to put into the fact of, um, if someone domestically wanted to try to compete for fiber production, how do they compete against Chinese farms that have thousands and thousands of acres with lower workforces and all the inputs that, that make them competitive in the textile industry globally, right? right. Last but not least is uh, for cultivation is going to be for these folks that are growing for CBD. Uh, this is the highest risk for farmers. It's definitely the most laborious due to sexing. Uh, the biggest thing that will kill 
uh, your CBD production is a bunch of male plants and that cross pollination and cross breeding and will de depreciate your CBD levels at a very high rate. I think that's where you'll start to see the use of the clones a lot more in that to get away from that. It kind of, it's more expensive up front than to buy a bunch of seeds, but at the same time, you're not paying the labor on the back end to go through the fields every day and sex them. Uh, we say sex, I mean, you're things. literally going through the field with a machete and yeah. chopping down male plants. It's it's you're, you're you're spacing your plants out far enough that hopefully that they're not going to be you know rubbing up against each other. And then as soon as you see the male plants, you're going in and you're chopping them down. Um, but what we see in terms of seed pricing is literally uh, feminized seeds are are almost twice as much as uh, the the non feminized seeds. And that's basically because of the like Chuck, Chuck alleviated. You can save yourself a lot of money on the back end. Um, there's still a shortage in seeds. Like we still find that a lot of folks, they don't have tons and tons of options when they're looking to make their first seed purchase. I think that'll change very quickly in the next two or three years. Um, but it is a challenge for these folks. So if you're looking at challenges for, you know, for cultivating CBD flower, one of them that you're going to run into, at least at this stage of the game, is going to be your seed selection. Um, this is going to be like a 120 day harvest time, very similar to marijuana. Uh, almost everything that you're doing here is going to be a lot more closer to like of all the, the practices and sub verticals of the hemp industry, anything that touches the, the chemical CBD or anything that's that you're going out with the goal of, of cultivating or processing CBD is when you're going to run into the largest hurdles. Um, but here's the upside. Um, we're going to give a, an incredibly wide range of numbers and then I'm going to kind of quantify why I'm saying that. So depending on the state, the circumstances, the cultivation method, cultivating hemp for CBD can generate anywhere between $2,500 an acre all the way up to $40,000 an acre. Okay. <laughs> for any farmer that just spit, <laughs> just spit his drink out and said, well, hell, 40000 an acre, where do I sign up? You know, that's that's not the norm. That's... Typically, what we would see a forty thousand dollar acre would be in a industrial greenhouse, right? Where you're growing where fourteen, the, fifteen, growing sixteen percent, sixteen percent CBD. CBD. Your operational costs are so high because you have the baddest RO two system. You have your electricity bills dollar, twice the yeah, You have a million dollar <laughs> right. HVAC system. Your electricity bill is astronomical. Yeah. You're basically spending all the expenditures that you would to grow incredibly high grade pharmaceutical grade right. medical cannabis. You're just growing for CBD levels instead of other cannabinoids. Um, but for these guys that are in the ground, and let's say they're getting, let's say they're getting twenty five hundred or thirty five hundred or four thousand, their low end of what these folks are getting for CBD is like the most optimistic or the highest end of what they're getting for soybean or for corn. So it's still a compelling argument to a farmer to say, hey, you know, let's let's try to get you to eight nine percent CBD in the fields. Let's try to get you an output of, of 3,500 or 4,000 an acre. And they're looking at the math and saying, okay, at, even at a small scale of five to 10 acres, that's still a viable expenditure of my time. And if I get good at this, you know, I can, I can scale up. So that's, um, that's why we see the push for CBD cultivation is because by far that has the highest lucrative uh, output and the, the highest upside uh, for these farmers. But what, what we're going to see is it's, it's, a, it's, it's the most challenging and didn't even get into the harvesting side of it. So, you know, when you're trying to, to harvest, heaven forbid, smokable CBD, but even <laughs> trying to harvest smokable CBD, I hope that you're not in a moisture uh, prone area and I hope that you're growing indoors. If you are trying to even harvest CBD or, or hemp for CBD production, basically going in and chopping down a plant and then transporting that plant to a processor who's going to either use ethanol or CO2 to make the extraction process happen. The moisture content is, is incredibly important, and I think that's what the, is going to be a, a huge challenge. Last year we had our wettest season ever in Maryland, and I don't know that we're going to see a, a huge influx in that this year. And if we get a wet summer and these guys are, are harvesting uh, – thousands of pounds of hemp and then throwing it in piles to let that moisture sit with the mold content. I just, I, 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 I'm hesitant and nervous to see 
what this looks like at least year one for these folks in Maryland that are trying to figure things out. Yeah, I think we'll get into, uh, when we really dig deep into CBD here in a minute, we'll get into what we our outlook for the hemp industry in Maryland and the CBD industry and kind of some things farmers should be on the lookout for if they want to test their hand in, in the CBD side of hemp. These farmers are almost always looking for a processing buyer. Typically, it's kind of the food chain. So it's going to go from the farm to a process or manufacturer. So farmers getting the raw material. Raw materials go into a process manufacturer, and that manufacturer is either going to make uh, a you know a, a product that's going to be put into a finished good or a finished product. Um, so the grain processing, those farmers that are selling the seed, like I mentioned earlier, is typically being made into either like a like a seed mash or, or like cake, I think cake, is what yeah, they call like it. Oat, yeah. yeah, I think it's like an oatmeal y cake consistency. Um, and that can be used for animal feed. Um, those seeds can be preserved and they can be used, like I mentioned, in like protein shakes. And uh, Chuck brought some delicious blueberry hemp seed superfood treat that. Yeah, if anybody, and this is just a fun little thing, if anybody's got time, they go into one of these organic type. Places you don't whether have to it's say it like that. whether you it's organic, you don't have to I like can't. organic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to hide where I went shopping, um, <laughs> but <laughs> like a Whole Foods or a Fresh Market or wherever you want to call it, if you're that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, if you go down some of these aisles, it's amazing to see the kind of products that are on the market already, and a lot of it has to do with the seeds, and they crush it up, they can make it in. Uh, mix it up with different things and make it into these cool power foods. They're healthy for you. Um, got good fats, they right? They got really good fats. Um, so the power foods, just the seeds themselves, the seeds are versatile. You can sprinkle them on yogurt, oatmeal, cereal, eat them out of your hand, put them in a protein shake, like a million different possibilities. So it's it's interesting if you're actually looking for them when you go into the store. To It's, it's cool to see what's already out there already. And that's only going to get bigger and bigger as the industry kind of progresses and moves forward. And then, like I mentioned, you see a lot of the seeds being processed into beauty products, taking the oils out of there and incorporating them into makeup and lipstick and other oils and lotions and potions and all the lady stuff that they use. Um, fiber processing, think, um, you know, think your textiles, think canvas, think uh, bags, um, really that gritty manila e color material um, that, that's, that's so resourceful and, and use useful and then the last piece is is going to be of the stalk processing that woody cores we made into pulp products paper hempcrete building materials um like one application was like solar panels and the idea was is that instead of using plastic or metal uh, materials um the hemp materials were lighter stronger and could hold high levels of heat and cold as, as kind of a very um, industrial grade product. Some of the applications that we see for, for hemp in general, it really goes across. Like, I think the thing about hemp that gets me excited in terms of our future is it, it goes by so many consumer verticals and so many product groups, so many different applications with so little research given into it so far that the more research that we do and the more that we understand the applications of this, the more that I am really convinced that we will see replacements for plastics and we will really start seeing hemp in general being incorporated in everything from fuels. It, it competes as a biofuel much, much more uh, efficiently than soy, soy or corn, corn, I'm sorry, corn or soybean or the ethanol based products that they're doing. Um, we see it like Chuck mentioned, it's already being incorporated in vehicle production, um, the textile industry, cosmetics, building materials, and then just a, a cleaner environment in general. I think if this is going to be a focus for our generation and we're going to say, okay, enough is enough. We have to start thinking more ethically about how we treat our planet as our population is considered a skyrocket. And it looks like the earth is deteriorating based upon that. I mean, this is something that could be used to remediate soil. It's something that looks like it could be able to reduce uh, bio, you know, non-biodegradable plastics and um paper products i mean if you think about toilet paper you're going from a tree that, that takes 25 years to grow um uh, turning into a paper product you're using one time and then flushing down and wasting versus hemp which i just mentioned could be grown in in eight weeks 
So I just think that there needs to be a shift in mindset in terms of how we're, we're getting our products and, and hemp seems to check a lot of boxes. Um, dollars rule everything. So if we want to find these more sustainable options, they got to make business sense, right? And as businesses look and have more options and are able to say, okay, I can meet my P&L and I can check all the boxes on the spreadsheet that makes the investors happy and keep our corporate commitment of going green and being more sustainable and more sensitive to our environmental impact. You know, I think hemp is something that is a tool that a lot of folks will be looking for. Do you agree? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's a good place to kind of leave it so we can get on to the elephant in the room, the topic everybody wants to talk about in, in CBD. Old CBD, the 500-pound grill in the room every time we talk about anything, it seems like, with uh, with hemp. And kind of as it should be. I mean, so if you are unfamiliar and you've been living under a rock and don't know what CBD is, CBD is one of the naturally occurring compounds that is in cannabis. So it is in both marijuana and hemp. It is safe. It's not intoxicating. It's not addictive. Um, it's one of the hundred, uh, phytocannabinoids and it's very similar to THC in terms of how it affects uh, the body and the endocannabinoid system in a lot of ways, um, except with that very distinguishing difference of the intoxicating effect. And they don't mimic each other exactly the same, but if you look at a chart of how cannabinoids work, you will see that CBD and THC will overlap in a lot of different ways. And for those folks, I think one of the reasons that it's gotten so much buzz is because it's kind of like, it's kind of like marijuana light and the fact that um, it's an anti-analgesic, it's anti-inflammatory, it, it helps with anxiety, it helps with, with uh, some of these other different things, but the person taking it is never going to feel intoxicated, they're never going to get high. So for those folks out there, and there's so many of them that uh, want no parts of getting high, this is like a really great herbal safe way for them to try to replace something like ibuprofen or maybe treat their Bell's palsy or uh, basically get a medical effect without having to do a couple of things. They don't have to go and get a medical card. They don't have to go and go into a dispensary. They don't have to worry about getting high. There's a lot of things that are um, that some folks feel is very risky that are really removed when they just go and try CBD. And there's a lot of um, well, there's a couple of things. Um, we're we're going to get into the difference between CBD and full spectrum hemp extract. So a lot of what I'm talking about when I say CBD and I'm talking about it in a very positive way, a lot of the efficacy and a lot of the studies show that you need more than just the CBD molecule alone, right? That you're going to need to have either a little THC, CBG, CBN. There's all these other phytocannabinoids. You're trying to balance an endocannabinoid system. So... When I mention, you know, our products and things that we, we, we distribute, they're all going to be full spectrum. They're all going to have a, a multitude of cannabinoids in different ratios. It's not just going to be the single molecule CBD. Um, and that's kind of, I think that's kind of where a lot of the ambiguity and the questions from, from folks go, come is because there's, th there, you're hearing all this promising um, messaging coming out about how CBD, the molecule itself, can can do all these positive things for folks, and then you're seeing products pop up in gas stations and head shops and porn stores and pharmacies and anywhere and everywhere. anywhere anything's being sold. They're Bed, starting to pop beyond. up. I got my mailer the other day. Your local um, multi-level marketing company that was selling health food products and then at one point was selling Tupperware and at one point might have been selling merchant services or energy uh, lowering your, your electric bills is now selling CBD as well. And that creates a ton of saturation in a market that is really emerging. It's still got a ton of growth in it, but it's saturated and it's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, treating people using cannabinoids is in our DNA in terms of what 
Peninsula Holistics and Peninsula Alternative Health does. In our dispensary, it's what we've done for the last couple of years. Um, it's how we train our staff. It's it's everything that we do. And I think it's disheartening to us to start to see these products with little little testing, little quality assurance, and no support at all start popping up in places like a Bed Bath Beyond or from a multi-level marketing company because the support behind that product is is not there. And although this can be used, you're not supposed to use the word for supplement, but you can be used as a supplement in terms of a daily driver, in terms of um, taking this every single day um, uh, to, to provide a, a balance to your endocannabinoid system and to create that balance. That's one way that folks can take it. But there's other folks that are taking it to, to actually treat conditions. There's folks that... Um, that have epilepsy. There's folks that um, that have conditions like fibromyalgia where a very specific dosing of cannabinoids, typically more than just what CBD uh, alone can do, is what is going to create health outcomes and really impact their lives. We see Bed Bath Beyond thrown in the back of a mailer next to their essential oils in a diffuser. And if I'm this patient that is suffering from a silent disease like fibromyalgia or I have a 12-year-old kid who's having seizures and I'm at my, my last wit's end in terms of how I can treat them. So now I'm going to go to Bed Bath Beyond and buy CBD, like isolate. Like it breaks my heart and it pisses me off that like that this is like what's happening. I'm going to maybe... Maybe I'm at my wit's end and I'm driving home and I'm at the Valero gas station pumping gas and I see the CBD sign. So I go in and I buy CBD because people do impulsive things like it, it's it's and then it doesn't work because it's crap or you didn't use it right. And then all of a sudden there becomes this messaging that, no, this is actually like not very useful or it didn't work for me. And, and all this these down. Uh, downtrotters and, and naysayers and it's it's not anything more than bad products and, and lack of support yeah and I think I will say this I know we spent a lot of time talking about in the beginning like the difference in cultivating for CBD and fiber and seeds so a lot of these companies that are selling these these products at gas stations all these are low quality products that come from overseas where they're cultivating these plants for fiber and for seed other than for CBD. So the amounts of, it may say CBD on the label, but the amounts of the, the cannabinoid CBD you're getting or any other cannabinoid for that matter are like negligent. And chances are it has, you don't feel the effects because it doesn't have any because what's I, on the label is not what's actually on the bottle i spoke to someone who tested the products and they tested a bath bomb and they told me that they couldn't find the, the cbd that was listed in that packaging on the bath bomb anyway and they knew the manufacturer who made the bath bomb put the cbd in it so it's it's becoming a marketing ploy it's becoming yep. a gimmick um we're seeing the exaggerations of claims of what you know we heard of a cancer patient this goes back to the multi-level marketing thing. So for those folks unfamiliar on how you build a multi-level marketing company, you basically are um, getting a bunch of, of 1099 independent contractor, independent people to come on and then handing them a right to go out and push your product. And then they are encouraged to, to, the, to then basically grow the business by not just selling the product, but then bringing friends and family and business partners underneath of them and then they move up the ladder and in the higher up the ladder it's it's it, it can be sometimes shaped just like this so when these <laughs> folks go out there is that a triangle uh, more like a pyramid oh. and then um when these folks go out there and they're they're trying to to build up the ladder and they're trying to move units they're not going and recruiting medical professionals they're not recruiting uh, even folks that have any type of industry knowledge, the the training that they get, we got to see the training. It was like it was written by a legal team, like disclaimer: say this, don't say that; do this, don't do that. It was no like patients can be helped by this, or, or certainly no, no, no patient anywhere. But like even like even really, what value are you bringing other than like 
selling them a bottle of CBD. And that was like your whole, the whole point. And it was a CBD isolate. And it's, it's just frustrating because the story that we, we saw unfold was a person had brain cancer. They were taking a two to one THC to CBD product, which is probably quite in line with what I would expect to see for the type of a regiment. And they had a relative that was recently in one of these multi-level marketing companies now selling this new CBD product and said, hey, dad, stop taking what the cannabis expert told you to take, knows what they're doing, and just take the CBD because the THC might make you drowsy as you're going through chemotherapy. It's... I don't think that it resonates to folks that are listening to the podcast how outrageous that is, but as someone who understands... Uh, what it's like to treat someone who's going through chemotherapy and to be to be playing a role in their their regiment. It's it's incredibly harmful to to do and recommend what she recommended, and and it's it's negligent. And that gentleman is going to have zero chance of getting any type of medical benefit from taking just CBD during chemotherapy, and um, probably will be a story of unsuccess that will get spread around and and not push this forward where so many people could, could be getting relief. So many people could be kicking uh, their ad bills and ibuprofens and all these things that are tearing up kidneys and livers and, and having harmful effects that people are taking every single day, you know, full spectrum hemp extract. Like we make a peninsula alternative health is a really great viable option. We see a ton of success from the people that take it. And a lot of the success comes from the fact that we're able to support the product in a way that, a multi-level marketing company built to expand and grow super fast can't like I, I have that choice if I wanted to I could go out and do the same thing and hire 20 people that just want to go out and hustle CBD on the side with their friends and family that would know how to support it and would bring in a ton of revenue um, and would sell bottles and move units but that's not morally conscious for me to do if you the very first person that we're bringing on to actually help with uh, the education and distribution of this product is a former nurse from John Hopkins who was a seasoned veteran in the cannabis industry. Someone that understands all the cannabinoids, is a nurse, and is able to support this product in a way that there's no one, you've convinced me that the 15 people sitting around a table at six o'clock on a Saturday discussing how they move from pink, blue to gray status up the ladder by moving 50 units over the next six weeks. Yay, yay, rah, rah. Like, no, that's not how it works. Like, This is about health outcomes. This is about treating people. This is about providing alternative to opioids. It's about cannabinoid-based health medicine. And unless you're a dispensary or unless you're focused on all the cannabinoids, I don't know how you can just say, I just sell CBD or CBD is the only cannabinoid that works or I'm just going to I'm just gonna not even act like THC has any purpose or that any of these other cannabinoids exist and I'm just going to go to my rah-rah parties and try to get people to use this one single cannabinoid. I think it's, it's, it's sad. And that's kind of my, my two cents. <laughs> um, it's just there's a policing issue. There's no way that that, that company that, that tries to grow that fast through that move up the ladder gimmick, there's no way that they have the ability to really regulate, support, and educate and if you're not regulating, supporting, and educating, and people are going around making false claims, and people are going around doing things that are hurting patients and people, you know, I just think that's a model that that's even viable. And I think that even if you are someone who is in it for the right reasons, but still affiliated with one of these organizations, your organization is not going to be around in two years, right? I don't, I don't think that I don't think the maturation of the market for CBD looks like it does today. You know, I think it, it looks much more like um, either basically cannabis dispensaries that are now open to adult use, and that's where you're going and getting your cannabinoid wellness products, or you're going to see what we see right here in town, where the local pharmacy sells his book of business to Walgreens, changes his business to a hemp health place, and is now, you know, selling holistic products because that's what the, kind of the future is, and that's where the demand is, is no one my age wants to get a regiment where I say, here, take these 13 pills where we find more and more often our parents and grandparents were just like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I, I share kind of the same views. I think in the near term, you're going to see, I mean, we already see it no matter where you live. I'm sure you see the banners flying along uh, a major road or intersection. It says CBD available for sale here. 
you know, these shops are popping up everywhere. There are CBD specific, CBD only, CBD flower shops. Um, they're all over the place. And I think, you know what, if that's the business you want and you have a goal to exit that business in two to three years, it, it might be okay. Um, but I think after that three, four year time mark, once the farm bill gets in, all the states have these programs in place, um, the larger institutional money and the capital is looking for places to go, new industries to invest. I think this thing's going to look a lot, a lot different than it does now. I don't think your gas stations are going to be selling, you know, shitty CBD from overseas. You're not going to buy it at 7-Eleven or Bed Bath and Beyond. Uh, and I think the consumer. The FDA is not going to allow it. We have a the, brand yeah. new chairman in the FDA. He's, this is already a very, you know, I think there's a working session next week in D.C. where they're hearing from stakeholders from the industry. Um, the FDA has got to make has got to make some decisions. So one thing that we didn't really get into, uh, which we can discuss now, is is CBD has also now been part of a patent for the very first time executed the GW Pharmaceuticals from the FDA. So for the very first time, right before this new guy, I'm sure he was thrilled, uh, took his job at the FDA, which, man, talk about a tough job. <laughs> that is one job I would not <laughs> ever want to have. I can't imagine being the head of the FDA. Um, <laughs> so the previous chairman of the FDA, uh, during his, his, um, his tenure, GW Pharmaceuticals out of Europe, got a patent on a CBD drug, Epilotics, that basically was used for kids in seizures, um, and it was derived from from hemp. And that patent, if, if argued the way that we've heard it argued from some attorneys, would actually give them the patent on a CBD isolate derived from hemp. It wouldn't give them a patent on a full spectrum hemp extract like we use that has multiple cannabinoids in it because that wasn't part of what they got patented. It wasn't part of their research. Um, it was just a straight CBD product. Um, and it also, interestingly enough, doesn't cover CBD that comes from marijuana or cannabis um, because that is still under the DEA purview. So hemp grown under the, the new farm bill moving forward will be under the Department of Ag's purview. CBD derived from marijuana is under the DEA's purview. <laughs> CBD derived from hemp as alone as an isolate is under the FDA. FDA's purview. So all these three letter agencies competing over this very murky water and like a lot of times it's looked at two ways. It's either I don't want to handle that or I need dollars and cents. I went under my my three letters and I think we're going to see some jockeying of that and I think the FDA having to get a clearer stance on regulating some of the stuff that we're seeing in gas stations interesting enough I can tell you the one area of, of cohesiveness that we have seen from a regulation standpoint at least locally here in Maryland is they don't want you to add CBD to food and drink uh, we had a couple of restaurants out there making some some drinks with it uh, adding it with a aspirations of adding it to smoothies and other things like you see in a lot of other states. Yeah. Um, but in Maryland, the Department of Health came down pretty quick to all those places and, and no fines or no no real penalties, but just the idea of not yet, not till we get a better understanding of what this looks like. So there's going to have to be some messaging. Yeah, I think this is something. I mean, these rules and regulations are going to be fought and pushed back on and redone for years and years and years to come. Um, I think clearing up some of the murkier waters first is definitely the way to go because we'd still all kind of operate in this legal gray area, um, especially when it comes down to CBD. So if we could get some clarity, at least on the additives, whether or not it's a supplement, we don't even know that. I don't think the FDA actually knows that right now. Number nine on their little memo said that we can't call it a supplement. Oh, we can't call it a supplement. Cannot call it a supplement. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, even to what to call but the e products even now. Though, it's, even though the application of for many folks, including myself, is to use as a, as a, a supplement. supplement. Yeah. Basically, I take it as a daily driver, <laughs> so, like yeah. a multivitamin. That's the that's how it works best for me. Is just to take it as a daily kind of driver at nighttime. So, and and from a marketing standpoint, like it's almost impossible to market our product because we can't. We don't know what to call it. We we don't we can't say what it actually does. Like it's it's. <laughs> it's pretty crazy in a lot of different ways in terms of 
the challenges that that face face any company that wants to that wants to get into this. So, um, I think at least setting up some criteria for what folks can look lo- look for in a quality product would would help them make sense, and then we can kind of sum up what we think will happen with, uh, with CBD and hemp moving forward. So, um, I'm always pro full spectrum versus isolate. There's certain uh, there are certainly some uses where isolate is, is applicable. Um, if you are someone that has to be THC free, I would still recommend going broad spectrum, um, going and getting some CBG, some CBN, some of those other cannabinoids that are in a product, but would still be a THC free product. Um, the, the technical term for that is broad spectrum. And then you want to, you want to find out where it's sourced, you know, to, to look at the labeling and see, does the labeling line up with what I think? Cause if it says a thousand milligrams of, a uh, full spectrum hemp extract, but it's in a 10 milliliter bottle. That's probably not likely. Um, if it only says a hundred mil- milligrams and it's in a 30 milliliter bottle, that's a pretty weak solution. So there are all these different things that you'd want to start looking for using a per milligram price is a pretty easy way to understand the pricing of your product. Um, especially for something like a tincture, you know, so you look at ours as, as 10 cents a milligram is what we charge for ours. It's, it's fairly competitive in the marketplace. Um, you know, for a high quality product that's, that's made craft style. And then, um, <clears throat> I think the support from the company is probably the biggest thing. I mean, I think that's the biggest differentiator that, we, that we're looking to move forward with our business. The Peninsula Holistics is, inc- is to bring on folks that are versed in all cannabinoids, um, and that are able to really help folks from a, a holistic 100, like a, a thousand foot level, not just try to slang them here's one product or some cbd isolate that may or may not help you and i know for us like we've been trying to do that kind of for a while and it's a struggle and there's no reason and i mean there's a reason why a lot of these companies put zero time and effort into the education um and the research and the development and the support of these products because it takes forever like we've been at this for a really really long time and we're well versed in the marijuana industry as well so it's a little bit easier for us i mean it just takes time and i think we've built the right platforms and we have the right ideas. Can you uh, imagine how hard it would, it, how long it would take and how much money it would cost to teach all the cashiers at Bed Bath and Beyond about the endocannabinoid system and how to effectively <laughs> do <dose> CBD. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing like... Maybe that's a business picture, model. Like, Maybe we just go train Bed Bath and Beyond and 7-Eleven and Valero as to what the products they sell actually do. <laughs> <laughs> Coming behind a tasty cake guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's what it seems like sometimes though um but there's a reason i mean there's a an absolute reason why you're seeing this flux is because the market for folks that are that are seeking these products is continuing to grow um i think hemp overall i think the international powerhouses are still going to dominate india and china i think you're going to see emerging markets like africa latin america um embrace this low technology crop this low technology cultivation process um and start to begin to get involved as well i think the largest opportunities at the u.s domestically are going to be around the cbd production and kind of craft cultivars these guys that are willing to grow small batch style high cbd grade uh hemp there's going to be a market for that for a while here and i think that's something that is exciting very similar to the the same guys that said you know what i'm going to grow hops for for Evo or Burley Oak or, or Sierra Nevada instead of growing yeah. corn, soybean, whatever I was growing before, tobacco farmers, and that's a dying breed. We're seeing these different um, legacy farming families looking for, like, what's next? Some of them are putting solar panels there, right? I mean, yeah. we've seen I mean, windmills and. It's innovation, right? And I think that, and that's the cool thing about hemp. And if you look at something like, um, oh, I think the company's called App Harvest, and they're out in Kentucky. I think they did a really cool story on it in 60 Minutes and talking about what hemp can do to kind of revitalize some of these rural agricultural areas. Um, and what they've done is they basically came in and employed an entire town. They have 100,000 square foot grow house, maybe even bigger, that's just growing, you know, hemp inside. Um, and it it's kind of turned how these people look at, look at the crop and it's employed a lot of people in the town. And I think hemp has a great 
great opportunity to come into some of these rural areas that have been neglected for so long as industry and mining's dried up in the United States as we push forward with different fuels and stuff. Like this is something that can really come in and help those towns. Um, and I think it's going to be exciting to see that. I think within the next three to five years, you're going to see a incredible change in the federal level regarding how marijuana is regulated. And I think as those regulations become held more to a federal standard and applied more consistently across the states, then um, there will be a huge influx in players from both marijuana and hemp markets doing mergers, acquisitions, and coming together. And you're seeing that now, even with the expectation that's going to happen. I mean, we saw a merger in the cannabis industry with the basically the caveat that the deal was contingent upon legalization of at least medical cannabis in the yeah, United States at the, right? at the federal level the yeah federal they even level. put a price on it so like to put a price on something to me and, and, put, and it go, out publicly, put it out publicly public. saying okay when it becomes legal federally like it's almost a sign that says hey everybody thinks it's getting closer and closer and these guys these smart guys aren't going to make deals like this in the public eye if you know if something wasn't gone on there so that's going to continue to to morph and it makes sense if it's the same plant and the regulations are in line that you wouldn't see the differentiation of companies i mean quite honestly we have two separate companies right now holistics and alternative health they're only separated because of regulation and law and if we could run them under the same tax uh, structure under the same uh, federal structure same everything it would be way easier for us just to message one brand but because of the way we're regulated it specifically has to be separate we are unable to sell our cbd products within our dispensary or any other maryland dispensary at this time um so it, it creates these like arbitrary divisions of companies that only exist because of arbitrary rules not because of the market or like what the business yeah. dictates yeah, because I mean, I think our focus in Darby will we'll say the same thing is on the total cannabinoid kind of picture. And in order to, it would be awesome if we could bring these two things, these two brands we've created together, because that would be the total cannabinoid picture. It's the wellness picture. It's the wellness picture. And that's what we're kind of after with us. And I think the last thing you're going to see is, is CBD is kind of the, the gown of the ball right now. But you're going to see a lot of research and development coming around CBG, CBN. Um, different versions of CBD, like CB, CBD VA, um, all these different variations of cannabinoids. Like I mentioned, there's over a hundred phytocannabinoids, and I think that they're going to find that they'll be able to get at least some, a, some or a multitude of them from a hemp product. And as the evolution and l regulation of marijuana changes, many markets will look to derive their cannabinoids from hemp as a more viable and cheaper way of doing so. If it's the same, if you get down to the nitty gritty and you get into the processing of it and you're just pulling molecules, if you can get the same molecule from plant A and plant B and plant A requires $20 million operation and plant B requires a million dollar operation, you're going to go to plant B, the hemp over, you know, the industrial side over maybe marijuana or cannabis. So, um, I think that, you know, eventually these other cannabinoids will have equally as much esteem and CBD will just be treated like anything else. It's kind of interesting how CBD has gotten this trajectory into the public eye. Um, and like I mentioned, in some ways, even starting to get claims that are unable to be substantiated. Yeah, and I think for the outlook, I, I think I share a lot of the same thoughts as Darwin. I will add, I think there's going to be a, I think there's going to be a, and I had to put it almost like consumer good type of industrial component to it that we've already seen some interesting action happen in, whether it be AB InBev, who's a huge international alcohol distributor. I think they're, are, are they Corona? Um, yeah, they're, Coors, they're like Budweiser. Budweiser. I mean, a whole gamut yeah, of things. They bought Anheuser-Busch, yeah. they have Corona, they have <laughs> Stella, they have a bunch they have a of... a huge portfolio around the world. And they bought, uh, and they had some M&A activity in the hemp space because they want to do the infused drink. I think hemp is going to where you see all these infusions and these Coca -Cola supplements. Coca-Cola invested products. in CBD, Co right? Coca-Cola invested in CBD. So I think a lot of these large multinational consumer good companies are, are going to make that industrial kind of step towards the large scale and just as almost like an additive to a wide variety of their products. And I also think, um, and so that's kind of on the industrial scale. Then the R and D part, there's so much out there. And I know we mentioned a million things at the beginning uh, of the podcast about what you can do with it, but the 
truth of the matter is, you know, the technology is not there to do it right now. And there's going to yeah, be a Under, ton of Under Armour money doesn't know what happens when you take hemp and add it to their micro cotton material and make a shirt, right? But in five or ten years, my assumption is that they'll be starting to begin those experiments as they be the fabrics become more available and more tested and they understand um, hemp is a fabric. I mean, it's, it's got a ton of, of benefits for a lot of different reasons. And I think you'll see more, more clothes and more things come out made from it. Yeah. And I think as, as consumers mature, right? Like we've been in this society for decades now where it's con- kind of consumer driven kind of economic engine, right? Where you put something new out and people are just buy it up and buy it up. And I think they're with our generation and some of the younger people, I think there's a step back towards this whole behavior of like consumerism. Right. And also at the same time, protecting the environment and being socially ethical. And I think this is something this industry has the chance to kind of hit on all those things. This product's way more uh, environmentally friendly than a lot of the plastics, biofuels, and all the other crap out there. It has a huge wellness component on it, which is becoming more and more in the forefront as people see what's happening in the, in the drug market and just you know, eating sugar and diabetes and all this crap. There's this refocus on this wellness and this kind of getting back to clean your roots. So clean living. And I think, uh, and this, I think this industry's got a shot at you know, really speaking to that. Coming back, right? Yeah, this industry's got back. a chance to come back yeah. and be the powerhouse industry that it was throughout our entire history up until about 150 years ago. Like, I think that's the thing that I always like felt great about cannabis as a medicine, understanding the, the true history of it. And like understanding that like, okay, if you take out this 100 in 25 year window like this was a viable consumer product our tire like mankind yep. hemp too so like I have no doubt that yeah we were fooled for 150 years but like you can't like, these things come in ebbs and flows and they come in cycles and like even if you pull the wool over the public's face for a certain period of time it almost always comes back eventually like you can only do it for a certain period of time and I just think that um we're too pragmatic in terms of like we're re- to Chuck's point. I think the consumers now are, are I can't believe that I'm not the youngest generation any longer <laughs> <laughs> that there's like a generation. I under think there's, me. there might even be two. <laughs> Depends on if you're X or Y, I guess. Just stop. <laughs> so anyway, but you know, they're, they're these guys, they don't, they're typically not um, looking to be frivolous with their money. They seem to be more conscious of their spending. They have higher brand loyalty. They care about the business's uh, economic, or not economic, but uh, environmental impact. And it's social impact. It's social impact. And I think that, like I mentioned earlier, I think that, you know, looking at using hemp for everything from packaging to different parts of the business is going to be a good play for that. So that's why I'm, I'm bullish on hemp. And that's why I think that um, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you're not going to see a decline in the hemp industry. You're going to see more and more of, uh, of it out there. So podcast number two in the books just over uh maybe like an hour and 20 minutes so that's yeah. about the format that we're going to stick with we'll try to go at least an hour and if we're kind of hot on a topic and i'm bashing somebody you're getting fired up then we'll keep going a little bit so episode two um episode three as a precursor is going to be a ten thousand square foot look at the cannabis industry we're going to try to do a state by state breakdown mm-hmm. who's got what program what's going on uh, what is a federal path to legalization? Uh, what does legalization look like here in Maryland? And, um, and a really, lot of the questions that people want to know. Yeah. On the, so if you were like, man, I thought you guys were going to talk about pot and you were upset that all we talked about was hemp today. Don't worry. <laughs> Episode three, we got you covered. Take care. Anthony Darby signing off. Chuck, make sure to uh, give us some likes and comments in the section below. <laughs>